Welcome back. So we remain in the part of the course that's dedicated to thinking about dynamics of biological systems. We've just finished a sweep through thinking about genetic regulatory networks. We looked at switches, we looked at oscillators, and now I'm going to change gears to prepare us for thinking about another topic that will occupy center stage in the course, and that's the cytoskeleton and active matter more generally. So the, I, I told you uh, in an earlier short vignette uh, where I critiqued my, um, my reference to the literature um, that I would try to do a better job of, of giving you a sense of the key papers that have led to some of the things that we're talking about. And this is truly one of my all-time favorite papers, it comes from the, the lab of Joe Howard. And what it, you'll, you'll see that it has to do with the way that a particular kinesin motor protein depolymerizes microtubules. So just by way of background, let me remind you that the cell, is, I'm, I'm thinking more so of the eukaryotic cell at the moment, although there are, are, are bacterial analogs, but the, the cell is spanned by a variety of different filamentous protein assemblies. You see here two of them, which are actin filaments and microtubules. The actin filaments are um, shown on the left. The microtubule is a hollow cylinder shown on the right. And the way that we're going to be thinking about these from the physical perspective is that the, the elongation of these filaments uh, will take place through an additive um, reaction shown on the, on the right-hand side, which basically, or sorry, the lower part, which shows you a polymer of length L to which a monomer is added at rate R, which leads to a, now a polymer of rate of length L plus one. And this idealization uh, is is fine and interesting, but we need to have our eyes wide open that there are all sorts of uh, provisos that have to do with, for example, the fact that the microtubule has protofilaments. In other words, it's not just one, the addition of one monomer, but there's a whole series of these guys. When they depolymerize, they do so differently than um, necessarily by the, the elimination of single monomers. And what I want to do is tell you about this experiment that was uh, reported in the paper that I just showed you. So the idea is shown at the top, which is that a microtubule is uh, put on a surface, a microscope cover slip to be precise, and then um, the microtubule is, is labeled, and you can see that the addition of this motor, KIP3, it's a unidirectional motor, it moves towards the plus end, and what's shown in the chymograph in part C, which you see here, this is time, going in this direction. So at the red point, they add the KIP3 motors, and what you see is the, the over time, you see the shortening of the, the microtubule. And the interpretation here is that KIP3 walks along the microtubule. When it arrives on the plus end, it removes a monomer or some number of monomers, and that's the shortening. At the bottom is a second motor. I'm not gonna comment on this, but that's very interesting too. And that's a mo motor that actually can, uh, called MCAK or MCAK, or uh, I'm not sure how people that, with the Jingo say it, but that motor uh, depolymerizes from both sides, if I remember correctly. And this series of images gives you an impression of you know, what you would see in the microscope. So this is the basis of the type of chymograph you see on the, the right-hand side, and, and it should be fairly evident. You know, it's, it's palpable to our senses with the use of a microscope, what's going on here. So um, another really interesting aspect of the data on this experiment is shown here, which is they were looking at the density of, of um, motors. And what I wanted you to, to note is that uh, there seems to be a linear increase in the density of motors as you go towards the plus N. And that's, that's an effect Another one of the effects that any model that we might write down should respond to. And let's see, um, I guess I just wanna give you one last uh, impression of interesting data and we'll, this is what we'll comment on is that the depolymerization rate uh, is a function of how long the microtubules are. So the longer they are, the faster they depolymerize. And this legend shows you the dependence on concentration of motors. So that's the, that's the scheme. Now the thing that I wanted to say is um, that we are going to entertain multiple times through the course, partly through lecture and partly through homework, 
the idea of length dependent rates of addition or subtraction. So as shown at the top is an example of a length independent picture of the dynamics of a filament where the addition rate and the, and the um, degradation rate, they're both independent of length because the x-axis in these graphs is length. And so the fact that these are horizontal lines is telling us that the, the microtubule addition and subtraction are indifferent to the length. On the other hand, in the bottom image, what you see is a very general case where you have, um, you have both a length dependent uh, assembly and disassembly rate. And that's, that's interesting because what that implies is that there's going to be a critical length at which those two things balance each other. And so the, the microtubule or the actin or whatever will be stabilized at that particular length. This kind of a model, uh, and I, I think I'll probably make reference to that later, um, will give rise in the most naive interpretation to an exponential distribution of lengths, which is, is fun and interesting to think about. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to write down, uh, so our goal is I want to figure out what dl by dt is. All right? We want to figure out what's the rate of change of uh, length and Specifically, this is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, the, um, the rate of arrival uh, to plus end uh, times the length removed per motor uh, times the density at the end, so something like that, and I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll be more precise about that later. So let me tell you the model that we're going to try to imagine, and that is uh, is shown in part B above. So, well, okay, let's start with part A. So this is kind of a, a more realistic schematic where we have a microtubule and there are motors that are arriving from solution. And when they arrive from solution, they're basically stuck on the microtubule until they reach the plus n and then they fall off. So that's our, that's our mental model of what's going on here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to discretize the microtubule, as I show you here, into a lattice. And what we're going to do is try to figure out the, the, basically the mass balance. Okay, we're going to imagine this thing is in steady state and we're going to work out what the mass balance is. So the, uh, the way that I might choose to write that is uh, let, let me define um, n uh, at i at time t plus delta t. And this is the number of motors in the ith box, the ith lattice site. at time uh, t plus delta t. So that's what I'm going to mean by this notation. And so we're going to follow the usual prescription, which is we're going to write down a mass balance. So the number that are in this box now is equal to the number that was in the box a moment before, and then plus uh, the number arriving from solution. plus the number arriving from the left, and then minus the number leaving to the right. Okay, so why, why, why would I write that down? I'm, it's really basically doing accounting, and, and you, I hope you're starting to see that a lot of these problems can be recast as problems in nothing more than accounting. We're just keeping track of the, the total number of molecules in a given volume element, basically. So here, um, there's three ways that you can change the number in a given box, as you can see up here. So how do I change the number in a given box? Well, I could have a guy arrive in a time delta t. Because these guys are moving off in this direction, they will leave this box. And because these guys are leaving that box, they will come into the box of interest. So that's what I've tried to write down here. So, um, so in the usual sort of format, 
um, I could rewrite this as n i of t and then plus k bind delta t. I'm just trying to use the same notation that I have up top. And then plus, uh, plus v delta t n i minus 1 uh, at t and then minus v delta t uh, n i at time t. And I have a, an important note here is that v is uh, the rate of uh, motor stepping. That's a number of steps per second, if you like. So it's not a, it's, it's got units of one over time. So units are second inverse. So I can rewrite my equation. So dn by dt is going to be equal to uh, k bind and then plus v n i minus 1 uh, and minus v n i of t. And in steady state, I can think of this then as uh, being given by, oops, in steady state, this tells me that I have uh, k bind over v uh, is going to be equal to n i minus n i minus 1. And I can, you know, if I, if I think of, this is position, so here's, you know, this one, two, out here I have i and i plus one and i minus one. And there's some, and I'm going to plot n of x, okay? So I'm now going to treat this as like a continuous function. So, you know, I have something like this, and what I want to do is I want to make the approximation that n i minus 1 is approximately equal to n i and then minus uh, d n by dx times a, where a is the lattice parameter in this model. So what do we get from that? We get that uh, dn by dx is equal to k bind over va. Let's check the units here. So on the left-hand side, I have units of 1 over length. Let's just make sure that that's true on the right-hand side. So I said that V has units of 1 over time, K bind has units of 1 over time, and A has units of length. And so that ends up giving me a 1 over length on the right-hand side as well. So this tells me, um, you know, I, so this basically is a differential equation for the number of motors as a function of position. And we can straightforwardly solve that as n of x is equal to k bind times x over va. And this tells me or implies that the number at the end is equal to k bind times l over va. OK, so what have, what have we accomplished? First of all, um, we're now ready to go back to this experiment because uh, we just said that n of x is equal to k bind x over va. In other words, we actually, we actually have a prediction about the slope of this line, which is that it's k bind over va. So we, uh, and, um, okay, well, so I'll, I'll come back to that maybe in a little bit. Um, so that, that's the first thing that we can say. In other words, we've, we've pr produced 
a steady state picture of the motor distribution, we find it's a linearly increasing function. That's interesting in and of itself because the way to think of it is that the motors are sprinkling down onto the microtubule and then they're, and then they're by definition, they're processive and move off towards the plus end. And that dynamics, just to use Jeremy Gunnar-Wardena's notion of pathetic thinking, that pathetic thinking already when mathematicized implies this linear increase. Now what I wanna do is I wanna figure out what is the DL by DT. So, uh, so let's see. So DL by DT, this is the, the rate of change of the length of the microtubule. And I've already said that I wanna, I wanna think of that as the number at the end times the length of microtubule taken away, you know, carried off uh, per KIP3 motor, and then times the rate of arrival of these motors. So this is going to be K bind times L over VA, and then the length carried, so that's, and then the length carried per motor is, I'm gonna call that A, and then the rate of arrival is V, and so this gives us this very simple relationship, which is that the rate uh, at which monomers are removed is proportional to the length. So that's what, uh, that's what I showed you in this data. So basically we've, we've actually, in this data, we have both of these effects because we just calculated that DL by DT is equal to K bind times L. And I'm gonna say that K bind is equal to some on rate times the concentration of motors, right? This is the concentration of motors. And what I'm arguing, so you can see, you know, the higher the concentration of motors, the higher K bind is. So for example, this curve or that line is steeper than this one. And that's because the K bind is higher because of the hidden concentration dependence, the hidden dependence on the concentration of motors. And these straight lines are the theoretical interpretation that we just gave. In other words, that's shown right here. We're saying the longer the microtubule is, the faster the depolymerization rate will be, which is what we see right here. Okay, so that's, that's the essence of what I wanted to say. Uh, this is our first introduction to this particular problem. But what we've done is we've once again used our rate equation mentality um, in order to attack you know, really fun and interesting experiment, this thing from the Joe Howard lab. And uh, we, we wrote down a rate equation. We went for a steady state. In the steady state setting, we were able to figure out the distribution of, of motors on the microtubules. And we were also able to figure out the rate of depolymerization, all very interesting and cool. And let me note that, um, that I did not, that I neglected some subtle effects that my student Vahe um, has thought about, which I think are really interesting. One of them is that there's kind of a Galilean relativity thing going on. And what I mean by that is that the microtubules might themselves be growing. And so I didn't include that relative, that difference in speed between the motor speed and the growth rate. So effectively what I have assumed, if you like, I mean, I haven't thought this through too deeply, but I think what I've effectively assumed is that the motor speed is much higher than the growth rate of the microtubules. And I, and I think we have to be more careful in the eventuality that we don't satisfy that, that limit. So I think, uh, I think that's my offering on, on, at least for this introductory treatment of uh, this microtubule problem. And I hope that you found it to be uh, a beautiful experiment and that you'll go read the paper and, um, and that it's a, it's a fun problem to think about from the point of view of the rate equation paradigm that we've been talking about.